you know, the people of God have been oppressed for many, many years. We certainly see that in the Bible. In the midst of it, there are some great stories about faith in hard times. Uh, I love the book of Daniel. Um, there's an apocalyptic feel to it. Um, some of its imagery and the visions are, are hard to understand. But there are human stories. There are um, events that take place that we've probably learned about as children if we came to Bible school or, or Sunday school uh, around the person of, Dan of Daniel. Uh, the story begins in the book with the people of Judah uh, falling. The southern kingdom had been uh, overwhelmed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian armies. Uh, the southern kingdom fell, northern kingdom a number of years before that. So the people of God were in yet another state of disarray. They took, as was common, uh, an invading force, conquering army would take the cream of their captives and try to retrain them to try to gain some advantage from their captives. Um, and particularly that was true, as we're told in the book of Daniel, that there were a certain number of young men that seemed to hold great potential and promise. Daniel, of course, being one of them. Daniel had three, three friends, and in Daniel chapter 1, we learn their names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Well, you may not be familiar with those names because those are Hebrew names. But as was often the case, um, they were given new names, Babylonian names. And we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel has his own story, and we might get to that some other time. But the truth of the matter is that um, these three men um, demonstrate the same kind of characteristics, qualities um, that Daniel showed. They were not going to um, turn their backs on their heritage, uh, even when it came to their their diets, their choice of nutrition. Um, these three, um, like Daniel, had been noticed and had been placed in some kind of like leadership development program, um, being trained for higher office. Um, those names probably so familiar to us. I know in my own family history that there are at least three Shadrach Wilbanks, uh, one of them who lived up on uh, Sand Mountain in the 1800s, uh, an interesting name. But what we remember about them is not so much their names, but the character that they displayed. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, like so many despots, um, had a pretty high opinion of himself, so much so that he decided that uh, what he needed to do was to make sure that the world remembered him. Um, and so he began to build his own uh, tribute. It was a statue, gold-plated, um, probably uh, some immense size, the Bible tells us, but uh, sometimes we don't quite translate the biblical measurements as we perhaps should. But we are told about this golden image in chapter 3. Um, height of 60 cubits, width of 6 cubits. So it, it wasn't hard to see. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar made it a, uh, a big deal for, uh, for his empire. And he assembles all of his court officials and of all different levels. And again, you can read some of this in chapter 3. Um, and so he sets this, this statue up. And um, he... He has uh, uh, his herald proclaim. Here's what he said. You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, and the entire musical en ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Because It was a big day, a day of um, celebrating Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the problem is that um, those Jewish young men were faithful to their God, not to some man who thought himself a God. Once again, that, that's a story that sort of resounds through, through history when um, people in power uh, can't handle it very well. The old saying, 
absolute power corrupts absolutely was true for Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, not only were people called to bow down and worship, there was a penalty if you didn't. Um, they had constructed uh, a place of execution. It was a furnace. Um, we don't know exactly how it was constructed, but we do know that it must have had some some way to be able to gaze down into the furnace and and see what was taking place. So it might it was not enclosed. So um, the word was was passed down that everybody had to bow down, but the penalty was also identified, and that is if you don't uh, bow down, you will pay the ultimate price. We'll throw you in the furnace. Well, we've all hear, heard the story. And so um, the word came that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going to be bowing down to any um, idol. It's against their, their faith, their allegiance to God. Well, that infuriated Nebuchadnezzar. And um, he gave them another chance. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't bend. Um, no matter what he said, they were resolute. I'll read you this, this passage here from chapter three, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, let it be known. O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. That's an amazing uh, faith, certainly to be admired, because here it is. Um, we're not going to bow down to your statue. We're not going to bow down to you. There's only one worthy of our worship. And we believe God can deliver us. But even if he chooses not to deliver us, we still are going to trust him. Wow, that's huge. Because in life, we think sometimes that our prayers are like magic formulas. I mean, after all, didn't Jesus say, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you? Not really. What he said was, if you ask anything in my name, suggesting that if we would ask for things as Jesus would ask for things, if we want what Jesus wants, it's much more likely to take place. But these men were saying, um, even if our prayers aren't answered like we would like them to be answered, that does not uh, affect our faith. Can we say that? Can we honestly say that regardless of what happens, the way things turn out, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have prayed for people. I prayed for healing, um, prayed for circumstances to change. Sometimes that takes place in these glorious ways that are so visible, uh, but often they don't. So our friend, our family member doesn't survive and we lose that person. That person dies. That's hard to take because we prayed. But our view is a short view. We don't see what God sees. We don't understand how God operates. We think we can, but as he says in Isaiah, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm glad for that. Boy, I'm glad for that. If the world operated by what I want, what I think, how I feel like things should be done, it'd be even in worse shape than it already is. No, I'm grateful for a God who's bigger, greater, wiser, stronger, um, knows all that there is to know, uses his power to accomplish his purpose. I wish we could remember that. Uses his power to accomplish his purpose. You know, as, as we enter into this time of conversation, um, several of them that will take place over the next several months, it's important for us to, to continue to seek the will of God. As you've heard it said, and you'll hear it many, many more times, uh, that's all we want. Nothing more, nothing less. We want God's will. That will will be played out. It will be um, made evident. Not necessarily on our time schedule. God doesn't own a watch. He's not looking at what's happening today or tomorrow. He sees the bigger picture. He knows how pieces fit together. There is a, a beautiful, beautiful um, 
portrait that's being painted. The portraits are not done, not accomplished in just a few moments. So it's important for us at Williams to trust God no matter what, because we know God loves us. And if we know how to treat our our children, as Jesus explained about fathers who know what to give and not to give to their children, if we can do that as earthly parents, how much more so can our heavenly parent know what's right for us and when it's right for us? So these three men are um, resolute in their faith. They, they say, whatever, whatever happens, we're going to trust our God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, I think at this point, he was hoping that they would uh, back off, that they would uh, deny their faith and that they could be saved. No, they weren't going to be saved. So we know what happens next. They're bound and they're thrown in the furnace. Uh, and the furnace has been heated to a, an incredible temperature, so much so that some of the guards who had thrown them in the furnace are actually burned to death. So the three are inside the furnace. And once again, somehow the king and his little entourage are able to, to see what's taking place in the furnace. And they see the most remarkable sight. They don't see three figures in the furnace. They see four. And the scholars have debated for centuries who the fourth person was. It was evident. They all saw him. There wasn't any doubt. The question is, who was he? Well, I personally feel, as some others do, I feel it was the preexistent Christ. Uh, we see Jesus appear uh, not in Bethlehem for the first time. We see his presence, as John tells us, at the very beginning of creation. There's never been a time when Jesus wasn't. So it's important for us to remember that. Could it be that Jesus himself was there, or was it an angel? Whoever it was, it was an angelic or a heavenly being. Um, and that being was there with those, those three men. And they were pulled out of the furnace their their clothes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. They were absolutely safe. Well, it was a, uh, we might call it a come to Jesus meeting for, uh, for Nebuchadnezzar. He realized that what he had seen here made his puny little statue almost irrelevant. Um, so he, uh, he realized that there was something very special, not only about these men, but about their faith. And so I wonder for us if the people around us would notice not what's so special about us, but what's so special about our faith. We get a chance to do that, to live out our faith in the way we, we live, the way we speak, the way we act, our attitudes, as well as our behaviors. I hope we can take a message of encouragement for the, from these three brave men that uh, regardless of what happens, our God is worthy of our trust. And maybe today you'll find yourself in a position where you need to be reminded that uh, I can lean on God because I know he's with me. I know he'll help me. Bless you.